This Restorative Justice Life is a production of Amplify RJ. Follow us on all social media platforms at Amplify RJ. Sign up for our email list and check out our website at AmplifyRJ.com to stay up to date on everything we have going on. Make sure you're subscribed to this feed on whatever platform you're listening on right now so you don't miss an episode. And finally, we'd love it if you left us a rating and review. It really helps us literally amplify this work. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the episode. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, the podcast that explores how the philosophy, practices, and values of restorative justice apply to our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Ryan Barcega Castro Harris, all five names for the ancestors, and I'm the founder of Amplify RJ. On this podcast, I talk with RJ practitioners, circle keepers, and others doing this work about how this way of being has impacted their lives. Welcome to This Restorative Justice Life, Dorothy. Who are you? I, I am, um, I'm Dorothy Diana Vandering. Who are you? I am a settler Canadian with European Dutch colonizing roots. I now live in Pooch Cove, Newfoundland, the first community to see the sun in North America. Um, but I also am living on stolen land from the Mi'kmaq and the Beothic who, and the Beothic, um, yeah, have essentially been uh, wiped out uh, from our land. And I also uh, acknowledge that our province, Newfoundland and Labrador, um, is, are the ancestral homelands of the Innu and the Inuit as well in Labrador. Who are you? I am the daughter of Garrett and Dini Grievers. Uh, two people who immigrated to Ontario just after they got married in um, 1948. Uh, they were passionate about doing their best to raise seven children. And I'm the fifth of seven. Who are you? I'm passionate. I'm someone who's passionate about finding a better way to disagree um, to find a better way to communicate with others and a better way to understand interconnectedness. Who are you? I am uh, someone who's been married for 41 years to my artist husband, Gerald. And we live and grapple with life together every morning over a cup of tea and a muffin. <laughs> Who are you? I'm also the mother of two adult children now who came to us in really a miraculous way. And they have challenged me to understand unconditional love. And finally, who are you? I, um, every day, I reflect on the fact that I am the child of a loving creator. I'm a hiker a gardener, a canoer, a lover of rocks and trees and of running water. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Dorothy. It is so good to have you here. Hey folks, I'm Elise, your producer, and welcome to This Restorative Justice Life. Today, we are welcoming Dorothy Vandering as our guest. Dorothy has been an educator for over 20 years. She always works to connect theory and practice in her current role as a researcher and teacher designing and implementing innovative and transformative professional development based on the practices of restorative justice. Most recently, she is challenged by the realities of colonization past and present and working to understand reconciliation as a settler Canadian. In this episode, you will hear a lot about her experience, especially in transformative justice, restorative justice, and honoring Indigenous roots. But before we get into this episode, don't forget to check out our Future Ancestor Collective and all of our workshops and courses. All of the information that you need below for these opportunities is linked in the show notes. 
If you ever want to hear more from Amplify RJ's This Restorative Justice Life podcast, make sure to check out our YouTube channel where we are posting clips of this very podcast so that you can see these important people in action as they tell their stories. On that note, let's get back to Dorothy's story. It's always good to check in. So to the fullest extent of the question, or however much you want to answer, how are you? Wow, uh, <laughs> that's that's a loaded question. Um, of course. I've been writing in a journal recently and in a few emails with people that my mind and my heart are are in a uh, a place of discomfort and a place of um, where I can't keep my thoughts straight. I think that's particular because this week in Canada, and that's also a global concern, the, the mass grave of 215 children was identified in Kamloops, BC. And in the past years, I've been grappling with my identity as a settler Canadian and my responsibility in terms of um, a past life of colonization by my ancestors, um, but the potential and the reality of recolonization that's happening today. And so as somebody who is not Indigenous, I'm really grappling to understand what it must be like to be Indigenous and grapple with something that has always been known by their communities, that many children lost their lives in these schools. But I'm I'm really grappling to know how to respond and how to walk with uh, people who are uh, who have been harmed uh, so so extensively. So how am I? Um, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day here, and it's so tempting to just um, celebrate all of that. But there's a real heaviness in in uh, in me. Yeah, and two things can definitely be true at once, right? Yeah. Um, there there is so much beauty in the midst of um, enormous pain mm-hmm. and and sadness. And I'm not indigenous to um, Turtle Island either, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the the things that uh, people who are indigenous um, both indigenous to uh the land that we now call bc um and just this this land in general right like i i don't immediately relate to that as well right um as someone who is black and is someone who is um filipino a filipino descent right part of my identity is a settler um immigrant right Mm -hmm. on this continent and then um, I don't think you can qualify uh, black people as settlers because my ancestors didn't come here by choice. Um, it, it's a tough thing where, like, in a lot of ways, I feel disconnected from this land, right? Because this is not the home of my ancestors. And, like, what is my responsibility here as someone who yeah. um, now has made home um, the ancestral land of the Kitsch and Thongva people, right, here mm-hmm. just outside of uh, Los Angeles? And while residential schools, um, the, uh, like residential schools still exist, <laughs> right? Yeah. That that system still exists, uh, at least here in the United States. And I don't know all of the history um, of what that's looked like um, in Canada. I've observed from afar that y'all have done a little bit better of a job than we have at acknowledging how, um, how messed up things yeah. have been. But I mean, there's still a long way to go. Um, I was reading a while ago, the indigenous people's history of the United States, right? And you see over and over and over and over. And so when I say reading, I was listening to it, right? And the way I listen to audiobooks um, is I'm often like binging them just like I would listen to a podcast. And when you binge a book like that um, and hear the stories of um, first genocide, right? Then like, oh, some kind of treaty. Then like, y'all get this land over here then like oh no we're reneging on that agreement um and then we're gonna take this land again um killing thousands millions more people in the process um and like oh no 
here's this treaty, <laughs> like you get this little land, and that process has happened over and over for generations, and now yeah. to the point where, you know, forced assimilation has been a part of this colonial project, often through, right, those residential schooling programs, and we're still feeling the effects of those now, right? We're talking about things that have happened in my lifetime, yes. right? Um, and, you know, I'm 30 years old, but like, mm-hmm. that's not, <laughs> that's not that long ago. And so like, I often talk about, you know, when we're doing restorative justice work, part of it, it like, and Amplifier J, it's like anti-racism, abolition, decolonization. Part of that decolonization is making sure that we're acknowledging where this work comes from, of course, yeah. right? But also like, what are the things that we're actively doing to <laughs> return uh, sovereignty, mm-hmm. right? To indigenous people. Um, and that is not an overnight thing, right? But like in our everyday moves, um, what is what is the thing? And I know, like, uh, I, it, this is not following the normal flow of our conversations, but you mentioned, like, even in your work with Relationships First, the organization that you're running, like, in, initially, you did not have mm-hmm. um, buy-in from Indigenous folks uh, mm-hmm. from where you are, and um, how have you now navigated that? Uh, it Well... <laughs> I just want to acknowledge what you shared because it's it's incredibly complex. But at the same time, I often think it's way simpler than we, <laughs> you know, I think we make it complex, right? And in terms of what we're doing with relationships first in our work here in Newfoundland and Labrador, it, you know what? I think in a lot of ways, I've been conscious of it for a long time. And like you said, we, we haven't done it like we should have, like we acknowledge the roots of restorative justice and and the little book of restorative justice and education, you know, we dedicate it to those indigenous peoples who have, who have, you know, been resilient in maintaining these values and these practices. But in a lot of ways, we're just at the very beginning of what that looks like. And so when we first um, began our organization Relationships First, um, we did reach out to Indigenous uh, leaders here in, in the province, and we, we didn't get a, a solid response right away in terms of partnering with us and so on. And so then because I felt like we just needed to get started with something. I thought we just need to start with the partners we have. And when I look back at that now, I, I'm sorry we did. I actually am sorry we did. Um, because though I feel like there was a real need for that, I don't think my skills were really strong in terms of reaching out like I should have or, um, or, or creating a better space for uh, for a relationship to develop. Now we've learned a lot since then, and we're currently working on a project that is being led um, by Indigenous leaders in the province. In particular, um, I'm indebted to Chief Missile Joe from Meopakek First Nation, and um, I can share a little bit more about that later. But currently, we're working on a gathering for November um, where um, we're inviting Indigenous leaders and elders from our province to lead Newfoundland and Labrador into restorative justice in a good way. And mm-hmm. I think from my perspective, from what I understand, I think that's quite um, quite new uh, or quite, you know, it's a unique response, but it's unique to who Newfoundland and Labrador is, Right. And I mean, even something like, you know, I wish I was not using the words Newfoundland and Labrador. I wish I was using the indigenous terms for this land. And, you know, I acknowledge that when I try those words on my tongue, they don't flow off my tongue Mm -hmm. very well. And I'm afraid of not saying them properly. And so then I default to, you know, the English terms. So it, it, we're, we're on that journey. And one of our um, uh, key goals right now is to revise like our implementation guide so that it is uh, so that we work together with Indigenous educators here to do a much better job of creating a guide that honors 
uh, indigenous uh, leadership. Yeah. And this is like the result of, you know, decades of your journey into restorative justice. And I want to touch on some of the things that you you just shared, but let's go back. You've probably been doing this work in some way before you even knew the word restorative justice. In your own words, how did this journey get started for you? Yes and no, I would say, you know, because I often hear people will say, um, yeah, but you know, we've been thinking these things for a long time, right? Mm -hmm even before we knew the term restorative justice. And I'll just go on record as saying, sure, I was interested in peace making and peace building and education and conflict resolution in education. But it was through my stance and my lens that I was totally unaware of at that time. That was about right and wrong, Mm. about black and white, about um, control mm. and the need to control. And so I, I actually would say that I haven't been doing this work for a long time. Well, a long time in terms of it's been about 15 years or maybe, let me see when I said 2005 that I really started at that in, in, a, um, in a significant way. But it was a... Um, well, I mean, that's like half my life ago. So. I know, I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. And I feel very, very old. I really do. <laughs> but it was really transformative because it forced me to look at how I was seeing the world. And I think it was the restorative justice framework that actually challenged me to understand that I have a pair of lenses that I look at the world through. And I credit um, uh, Howard Zare and just the title of his book, Changing Lenses, Mm -hmm. um, with challenging me to do that. And I was a primary elementary teacher for um, about 20 years before I started doing some curriculum writing and then got into um, my graduate work. And as a, as a primary elementary teacher, you're always trying to take ideas and concepts and make them make them uh, concrete and real for, mm-hmm. for young children. And so when I started um, in particular, my, my study with restorative justice education, I, I kept doing that, kept wanting to find ways to make the ideas, the concepts concrete. And so one of the ways I did that was by um, having, my, having myself create a pair of glasses um, with with frames where I wrote on the frames, um, uh, on the outside of the frames, who uh, who I am, just like your your seven questions, you know who who you are, um, in in terms of what was kind of evident to people um, looking at me. But on the inside of the frames, I I wrote, um, you know, what are the groups I'm born into? Um, what are you know? that might that have an incredible amount of influence on how I see the world right so um, that idea of changing lenses um, that Howard Zare puts forward uh, really challenged me to think about what were the lenses I was wearing and what did I need to take off and what did I need to take on and so that became um, a a very concrete um, metaphor in in my work you know yeah what introduced you to his work i i was introduced initially to the work of restorative justice um education um when my two sons were in elementary school and um columbine happened and in canada a couple months later Tabor happened uh where there was school shootings as well and um, then, then all the schools in North America, I would say, kind of went into this mode of zero tolerance, right? Sure. And our school as well. And I was a, um, a teacher and a part-time uh, vice principal at the school that my children went to. And um, I had done a lot of work on peacemaking education and conflict resolution up until that point. And we were training uh, students to be peacemakers on the playground. And we had a very peaceful school, right? But when Columbine and Tabor happened, you know, our our leadership just followed the zero tolerance route. 
And so suddenly it was not appropriate anymore for children to touch each other on the playground. It was not appropriate for them to be, um, you know, kind of rambunctious. And so my own children, uh, two boys, they were in grade four and seven, I guess, at the time. And they, um, they started getting kicked out of school, right? And, and they were, um, you know, they were energetic boys, but they were not malicious in any way. And they, you know, but they would get kicked out for a day if they pushed somebody on the playground, they would get kicked out if they, if they said something inappropriate to another person. And, and so my husband and I suddenly found ourselves at home with our, and my husband was an artist uh, working from home. So he found himself at home (laughs) with the boys. Um, And, and we got progressively more and more frustrated because we really saw it as a reflection on us as parents and we were part of a close-knit community and we really felt for our our sons but we started to understand how them being kicked out of school um how much of an impact that had on them personally on each other as brothers on us as a family on their relationship with their peers on their um relationship with the community and our relationship my, with my colleagues, with their teachers, with, you know, my friends. And so um, after about the fourth or fifth time, my oldest was suspended. We, I was talking to a friend who was involved in restorative justice in education, or not in education, restorative justice in criminal justice uh, context, which was quite new at the time. And he gave me an article that was written by uh, Ted Wachtel and Paul McCold on mm-hmm. on restorative justice i think it's one of the first ones that ever was uh, described it was a four pager i read it and um i understood suddenly what was missing in my approach to peace making education okay and and it then i started and i started to use some of those practices and everything in, changed in my classroom and in our family we started to apply some of the questions we started but I started to realize that I was using them still to maintain my control as a parent, okay, and as a teacher. And lots of good things happened, but I started to realize that at the end of the day, it was still about me being in control and not me being in a good relationship with my children or my students, right? So that's how that started. And so I wanted to know what was going on, that everything was changing, right? And then I started to explore restorative justice more. And when I started my doctoral work, of course, then I had to dig deeper. And um, yeah, uh, Howard Zare was, you know, literature was some of the very early stuff that was written about restorative justice in the Western uh, faith-based context. Okay. Yeah, we're going to link um, the, the the talk that you gave a couple months back on radical love to uh, recall or recolonization. Yeah. Um, in, in the description in the show notes, but one of the things that you talk about there really was this idea of like, have we just used the words quote unquote restorative justice to like model control? Um, who were the people who helped you, who, who helped challenge your thinking around that? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. I think, I think that I was brought up short in my passion for restorative justice quite early in my doctoral studies when a colleague mm-hmm. Um, Lisa Fadden um, challenged me when I did a presentation and was so excited about, oh, you know what, this is, this is something that I was going to research. And so I introduced my, you know, six or seven um, uh, PhD uh, colleagues to my work. And I showed a video clip and I shared some of the key aspects that I had learned through some of the, the um, um, professional learning and training I had gone through. And then, um, and then Lisa just looked at me and she said, and, and we had been looking at, at research through a critical theory lens. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so critical theory, um, and it took me a long time to understand this, but critical theory, this is how I understand it is you all, you look at everything that's happening and you ask yourself two questions, who's benefiting and who's bearing the burden. Yeah. And so Lisa said to me, Dorothy, the adults are still benefiting and it's the kids who are still bearing the burden. And I remember going, no, no, no. And I, and I tried to explain it. And then I said, you're right. Okay. 
And that was, um, that was my first kind of where I was confronted. But it was also where I really had to examine how restorative justice and how it was being interpreted could cause harm and often was causing harm. And that's also where I became much more interested in the etymology of justice. Like what exactly do we mean when we use the term justice, but yeah. also then began to be introduced to some of the ideas of um, the indigenous roots through the work of Kay Prentice and Barry Stewart and Mark Wedge and so on. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Can you go into the etymology of the word justice? Because mm-hmm. when I think of justice, uh, and like if you look it up in the dictionary, it's all about the law. Mm-hmm. Um, how have you learned about the the origins of the word? Good question. Uh, I think you know my early introduction introduction to a more holistic way of thinking about justice came as a child, when um, in my uh, church context. We, mem- we memorized the uh, Micah 6, verse 8. What does God require of you? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Um, and, and that was a passage that always sat with me. And so when, when I started to get introduced to restorative justice, and it kept talking about crime and the judicial system, I kept going, there's got to be more, there's got to be more. And that's where I really started to explore uh, Howard Zare's work, where he has a whole chapter on shalom and justice, and that justice is about um, ultimately a way of being, you know, that ensures that everybody is well, that everybody lives in peace. And then as I dug deeper, um, Nicholas Waltersdorf's work uh, explains justice in through primary justice and secondary justice, where primary justice, um, well, ultimately that, that justice um, works around core beliefs and the core beliefs being um, that all people are worthy and all people are interconnected, right? And that primary justice is about nurturing worth and interconnectedness. And secondary justice then is about reestablishing worth and connectedness when harm is done. And that made a lot of sense to me, right? And at that point, I um, believed very strongly that we could not drop the term justice. So I know that there are many people working in restorative justice that talk about restorative practices, restorative approaches, and so on. But I I feel very, very strongly that it's important to hang on to the term justice because justice in, in that holistic sense is the pivotal point for understanding how to live, right? Yeah. Um, but in our westernized society, we basically co-opted the word justice, right? However, I always ask this question, what is it about restorative justice that we always immediately default to the judicial system? But when we talk about social justice, we don't do that. Like, hmm. like why, why can't we talk about social justice and know that we're not talking about the judicial system? Well, That's social really justice, social justice is really that primary justice. How do we nurture And so when we're talking about restorative justice, from my perspective, what is being restored is not the relationship necessarily. That's not first and foremost what it's about. Restorative justice is about restoring the dignity and the worth of the people or the environment even that they're a part of, right? Or the institution that they're a part of. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, how do we, how do we restore dignity and worth that is often robbed from people or the environment. Well, when we have a system that's built on, like, let's talk about the school system, right? Restorative justice education. When we have a system that is built on producing workers, Mm -hmm. right? Like, what is there to restore there? Um, Well, um, not much. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. In fact. So, so, yeah. So, like, what are we doing? (laughs) Right. So, in fact, I mean, you know, last summer's, um, you know, Black Lives Matter movement and the whole thing of dismantling police um, systems and stuff like that, that was really challenging. And it was really important, I think, 
right? And I think in a lot of ways, we do, we do need to dismantle our current system. I, I just don't, the, the approach that I'm taking though, is that how do we dismantle without causing complete chaos? And so I, I'm not sure, and, and maybe it's naive on my part, or maybe it's um, just a lack of courage, mm. but I often think that there is potential to change things from within. But at the end of the day, at a certain point, there has to be a dismantling of the framework that causes harm. And so that's why I think restorative justice in education, that holistic sense of it is so important, right? Because unless there's a framework that can replace the current framework, we're not gonna do it because then we're just gonna be co-opted by the framework or the value system or the belief structure that is currently in place. So that's why, you know, the work that Kathy Evans and I do and that we've shared in the little book of restorative justice education is primarily about what is the framework that you're working out of. And I know that Kay Pranis and Carolyn Boys Watson have done something very similar. And there are others as well, um, you know, um, uh, Belinda Hopkins and Michelle Stowe, you know, they are, they are working at this work through an understanding that that philosophical framework has to be addressed. But if in restorative justice, education, we can't articulate what that framework is, then we're not going, there's, it's not going to be sustainable. We will just be co-opted. So when I talk about, when I think about like dismantling something like the school to prison pipeline, yeah. right? Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about how abolition is as much about creating life-giving systems as much as it is dismantling, yeah. right? And so like, I, I don't know, right? I'm someone who has often said that, you know, restorative justice doesn't belong in schools, mm. dot, 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 institutionally, right? <laughs> because like the, the goals of the schools as an institution and what restorative justice, philosophy, ways of being frameworks are, are antithetical yeah. to each other, right? Um, and it is harm reductive to have people who are working within those systems um, pushing up against those and valuing relationships, valuing humans and doing what is right for not just the students, but like yeah. their their peers um, and the community around them, right? A lot of times we think about schools just as places where children go to learn, but they're also places where people go to work. They're also places where communities gather. They're mm -hmm. also places where people get resources. So it's not, it, it is, a lot of it is about the, the students and the young people, but there are other people mm -hmm. who are impacted by the ways that we are in Good relationship or not in good relationship with each other and so when i think about this like the the work of amplify rj right is to let people know like what this is mm -hmm. um and like i I've, i haven't gotten to the place where i'm prescriptive about like this is what it should look like mm -hmm. in a lot of ways it looks different for every community but yeah. i think that those those principles about what you're talking about like human dignity um are important and you know, a lot of times I'm able to navigate um, systems where humans aren't valued and, um, you know, where it's productivity over people, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, because of the way that I've been socialized yeah. into a culture that has incentivized me to, uh, we'll say, play the game, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. My parents uh, were people who were able to uh, play the game yeah. very well, right? Like both having uh, higher education mm -hmm. degrees and, you know, have been, I'll say rewarded yeah. um, by by these by these systems. And so like, that's how I was brought up. But at what cost, yeah. right? Um, who are we disconnected from? What are the relationships that we don't have? And I'm not someone who really experienced a lot of, a lot of pain mm -hmm. um, going through the school system. And yet, even now, right? Um, you know, however many years after the fact, I look back and think about um, the ways that relationships, 
like I, I can look back on some of those things fondly mm-hmm. and have like positive memories, but also look back at the way that like relationships weren't valued and being disconnected from the land and being mm-hmm. disconnected from my history. And when we think about education just as a vehicle to produce workers, mm-hmm. um, like we really have to start questioning like what it is that we're trying to do. Yeah. And it, it's, it's easier for people to like, oh, I'm going to ask this restorative set of questions, yeah. right? Like what happened, who was impacted and how, yeah. and how can we make it right? It's easier for people to like, oh, like we just have to ask this different set of questions and all our problems will be yeah. solved. Yeah. Um, then it is to have this paradigm shift of how are we preparing, um, how, well, how are we creating an environment where, um, you know, people are in, inherently valued for their mm-hmm. dignity and um, are being prepared to grow in the ways that one, they want to grow in and yeah. that are going to prepare them uh, to be contributing uh, members of our community, not yeah. necessarily like factory workers, right? Or mm-hmm. being able to fill XYZ job and take directions, right? right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger shift. Yeah, it is. Thanks a lot for sharing that, David, and and just your perspectives on that, because I think that's the work that we're involved in right now. We're all grappling. You know, none of us have arrived at mm-hmm. at at a way of doing this. And the, and like you said, there's not a um, you know, there there is no recipe for this, right? There's no recipe for this. And earlier you asked me, you know, probably earlier in my life, I'd already been, you know, living out restorative justice principles, you know, when I didn't even know about restorative justice. And I said, I said, No, I don't, I don't think so. Because, you know what, I I believe that, that we all have work out of a belief system. Mm -hmm. Right. But I don't think in schools or in our communities that we're encouraged to examine those belief systems or to um, even identify those belief systems. They're assumed belief systems. Mm-hmm. And when you have two people or two groups of people that, that get together and end up being in conflict, it's often because of different belief systems, right? And so you've identified very well that the structure of the institutional school is problematic. But how many people could articulate that schools were set up, you know, during the Industrial Revolution to create workers for for factories, right, and to be compliant and to respond to bells and all that kind of stuff? You know, most people, the general public, they don't know that, right? They've been fed a whole different line about, well, if you go to school, you'll get a good job when you grow up. And one of my biggest beefs and something that I keep thinking I have to do some research on is that when you ask young children, kindergarten students, why they go to school, ask, ask, you know, a four and five year old why they go to school. And you know what, some of them might say, because I want to be with my friends, or because, you know, I want to see my teacher or, you know, because I want to have fun. But eventually, almost every single one of them will say, because I need a good job when I grow up. And where are they getting that message? Well, they're getting it from parents who have experienced that if they played the school game right, they got a good job. But the interesting thing about our society today is that that's no longer true. You can be incredibly successful in school and still be unemployed because our society has shifted. So what is, I think, in educational institutions, K to post-secondary as well as in our communities, we need to be asking ourselves, what what do we believe about what it is to be human? And we don't have those conversations. And so we can't identify the reality that our schools are breaking down because people are promoting an assumed framework that is you are only valuable if you contribute to the economic system. Right. And so I, I see restorative justice as um, a whole philosophical shift. But like you, it, you know, I'd be curious for you to unpack a little bit more about, you know, 
I, I'm not sure I heard you correctly that, you know, restorative justice just doesn't have a place in schools, right? Mm. Yeah, when I think about um, the way that restorative justice gets brought into schools, yeah. um, it is often administrators, yeah. right, trying to control control people another yeah. different way yeah, right absolutely yeah <laughs> and you know what it's it's and i'll call it out you know from my perspective it's just when that happens it's wrong it's just wrong and and restorative justice will cause further harm when that happens right and i've seen it happen over and over and over again right i've seen good things happen with restorative justice in schools but I also see and have parents or people come to me and say, Dorothy, my kid's teacher tried to have a circle when something went wrong with the class. And it was unbelievable how my child got centered out. And they don't want to go to school anymore. I, I've talked to, um, you know, staffs where somebody came in to facilitate a circle with the staff because the staff was at odds with each other. Right. And what came out was, you know, a barrage of anger towards one or two people who were sitting in that circle. And they said to me, you know, Dorothy, I, I thought I understood what restorative justice was. And I had a lot of respect for restorative justice until I had to sit in circle. And, mm -hmm. and the facilitator allowed my dignity to be undermined and didn't do anything. Right. And so when we are doing circles, who is it that is saying this was good? <laughs> is it the administrator? Is it the teacher? Is it the facilitators? Or is it the people who have experienced harm and caused harm? Who are we asking yeah. about whether this has been a good experience? And I know we're asking you know, some, and, and I also know, like, like sometimes when I talk, I go, my goodness, Dorothy, are you um, totally dumping on restorative justice or are you advocating for it? I'm advocating for it in a big way mm -hmm. because I believe it has the potential, but yeah. it's going to be generational before we know how to do it and live it well. Yeah. And, and when I think about, you know, the things that you shared, like, I think there's a place for people to practice yes. restorative ways of being. Yep. It can't be mandated. No. Nope. Right. And when we have a system that is all about uh, mandates and like, yep. this is how, like, we spent this money on this trainer to come and facilitate this. Everybody has to do this. Like, that's not the, no. that's not how you bring people into doing um, the internal work that it takes to do, to, to navigate that mindset shift. When I, I frame a lot of the work around, um, I, uh, are you familiar with the uh, characteristics of white supremacy culture um, oh. as identified by Tema Ogun? No. Okay. Um, I'll link that to you. But like, yeah. I'm thinking about, um, you know, restorative justice as antidotes to that, right? Yeah. Um, and you can't force somebody no. to, to, to interrogate those things. And if you're saying like, all right, now you have to... To, to someone who has not gone through that process, like, all right, now you have to go facilitate a circle for <laughs> whoever, right? They're not going to be able to hold space for the, the emotions that come up in that space. They're not going to be able to be responsive to the needs of the people that come up, right? Um, they're not going to know what to look for. And so, um, you know, the beauty of what's been able to happen within the context of Amplify RJ is that, you know, on the internet, uh, people who are actively searching for these things um, have come. And when you're in that frame, um, you know, the, the learning and the transformation um, can, can happen. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it can't happen within the context of like a mandated, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, school professional development. But, you know, when it's in the context of a professional development, the expectation is often like, all right, we did this training. Now we have these skills. Now we're going to practice this flawlessly. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. And that's just not how it goes. And I think when people have that expectation of restorative justice being this cure all mm -hmm. uh, or panacea, right. Yeah. Or um, all of the problems that we have, whether they are <laughs> about racial discrimination, uh, gender injustice, uh, LGBTQ, IAP plus, um, 
discrimination on top of like school behavior like that's not it <laughs> no. that's not it see and and i think you know from my perspective in an ideal context what you're describing is is um the omission of one of the key principles of restorative justice and that is that it be invitational so um when i get asked to do professional learning for a school or for a group i will always ask is this mandated or is this something that everyone is coming to because they want to come to it right um and if it is predominantly mandated i will actually just say that they're not ready to to mm -hmm. begin that journey right and so in our implementation guide we actually you know we talk we talk about that a little bit um, but the, you know, it needs to be invitational. Um, and so in the same way, you know, a school district or the Department of Education, they can put it into their policies. But if they put it into their policies and then mandate that it happens, I will be the first to stand up to say, you know what, it can't be done this way. We have to rethink how we do this because it needs to be invitational. So we are working on some of those things here in the province, right? So, and, and interestingly enough, um, in Newfoundland Labrador, you know, the most recent election and the mandate letter for the um, Minister of Education includes restorative justice. Mm. So now, from my perspective, I will be watching to see if or how can we continue down this path in an invitational way. So there is a, a um, you know, a disruption of the system that hopefully we'll be able to uh, navigate and encourage, right? So yeah. that's, that's the one thing. And then the second thing, in my dream of dreams, is that we would not focus on the students in a school, but we would focus on the, um, on the adults in a school. Right. Yeah. Because if the adults get it and if the adults learn how to live it, they will automatically convey that to the children and students and live with the children and youth in that way. But too often in school, we say we have to teach the kids. We have to teach the kids. And then because otherwise it's never going to change. And I go, no, I'm sorry. But if we try to teach the kids, but don't expect the same thing from the adults, then we put the children and the youth in a really precarious position. Yeah, I think about the James Baldwin quote. Right? Yeah. Uh, children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they've never failed to imitate them. Yeah. Right. If you're telling kids to do something and like are modeling something different, yeah. like they're smart. I would also like extend that model to like <laughs> when teacher mm -hmm. teachers, right, school staff. Mm -hmm. um, are being told to do something that their leadership isn't modeling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right? And absolutely. so like, I, it does have to be invitational. And like, yeah. there is an incredible amount of, like of a sense of urgency yeah. because of the harm that is actively happening. How do you invite uh, school leaders or people who are working in schools to, to uh, manage that balance of like, this needs to change and we can't force people to do it overnight? I know. Well, we're working hard here yeah. to do that. And it feels like it's been a long journey. But what's really interesting is when I came to Newfoundland Labrador in 2009, I had, I came with the benefit of having seen how it was implemented in different provinces or different school districts, and how the focus had been on behavior and harm, right? And from a very early on, because of what Lisa said to me, um, I, I was very conscious that it can't, uh, restorative justice cannot simply be about harm because the, if we address the harm, the culture doesn't necessarily change, right? Mm -hmm. So in the little book of restorative justice education, Kathy and I actually have the, the Venn diagram of um, around the, the core beliefs of, 
of worth and interconnectedness being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, nurturing healthy communities, um, uh, creating just and equitable learning environments, and addressing harm and transforming conflict, right? So, so restorative justice gets presented as this holistic way of being, because mm -hmm. if we're only going to use restorative justice practices to address the harm, that doesn't ensure that just and equitable learning environments are going to happen. And so the, let's say the children or youth who might go through, or even the teachers or adults in the school who may participate in a, a restorative justice conference to address harm, the likelihood that that harm has happened because, because there's something in the system that has pushed these people to cause harm or to experience harm we, we we need to be changing the system within which harm happens because the system could be creating the conditions that 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 the children and youth you know model so one of the other things kathy and i talk about is trickle down bullying and that's not our own term and i'm forgetting where that's coming from off the top of my head but you know i mean there's such an outcry about bullying in schools and so on and so forth. And I'm not minimizing that bullying happens, but it is is very problematic, that discourse around bullying. Um, but um, Maureen Johnson. OK, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, just a quick Google. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, but, you know, the the school executive, the district and board executives are putting a lot of pressure on administrators, right? Mm -hmm administrators then feel stress and pressure and a lot of bullying techniques to be perfectly honest from their from their superiors and they transfer that to the the you know to their staff and to their teachers right and then and then the staff and teachers feel incredibly stressed and bullied and have no way out so it ends up landing on the on the children and youth and so the children and youth what do they do? Well, they take it out on each other. And then we all outcry and go, what terrible thing is happening here? But the children and youth are the canary in the minefield, right? Or in the mine shaft, right? Like we need to be looking at what they're doing and saying, where is this coming from? And that's where that's where those other two circles are so important, is that those re responses and reactions are coming from contexts that are not just inequitable or where relationships aren't nurtured. nurtured. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, when I, when I hear you talking about that, like <laughs> um, we haven't really explored within the context of this podcast, uh, the ideas of transformative justice, right. right? And I do think there are there are important nuances, right? Because when we get into the conversation about like transforming the systems or transforming the conditions mm -hmm. under like which this harm is happening, like I think that's where transformative justice comes in. And like, I think that's still important work for restorative justice practitioners to be asking because um, we're not doing this in a vacuum, right? Yep. We're not like we're doing this in the context of, uh, for me, the United States of America, you mm -hmm. Canada, where there is this priority coming down from the very, very top about like, this is what we need to be producing and like it's it's not that we're saying like school administrators are all powerful um they they have bosses right uh people from districts have quote unquote policies um and it, i think like we're the product of schools is students graduating right with whatever test scores and then like whatever college acceptance rates and all these things and like so what are the ways that we are shifting people's incentives towards like treat humans well fr from like uh from produce these high achieving students to like treating people well mm -hmm. and then preparing them for the world in whatever way makes sense to them and i'm not really talking about um college mm -hmm. or post-secondary education how are you moving in relationship with people yeah. and i think part of that is you know the things that you do and produce in the world but like that's not most of of who people no, are no. um i'm reflecting on the podcast that aired last week with uh stephanie sarantos um uh, where you know at the school that she uh works w at um the, it's a no curriculum school mm -hmm. um 
and you know they've worked it so from ages four through 19 um, their students quote unquote graduate with both a high school diploma and an AA degree Mm -hmm. right and have gone on to do all sorts of different things and have gone on to uh, like within the context of higher education and professional jobs Mm -hmm. right but what they're most proud of is the way that their students are able to navigate relationships with people and be affirmed for like all the unique gifts Mm -hmm. that they bring um and schools in our construction don't do that i'm curious if you have like maybe like a sudbury model um or some other model of like what this kind of really relationship driven schooling looks like or maybe it's a vision yeah I i think it's mostly a vision And I realized that your previous question, I didn't finish or didn't answer in that when I came to Newfoundland and Labrador, I was determined to introduce restorative justice to schools um, through that relational lens Mm -hmm. so that there was a deep understanding of developing relationships in the school and in a community before addressing harm. So Mm -hmm. ironically, what has happened (laughs) is that many of the schools and the educators in Newfoundland and Labrador um, have really grasped that and do a lot of circle work in in the way that Kay Prentice and Carolyn Boyce Watson um, describe that. but are very, very reluctant to use circles for harm. Mm. Okay, so we've got kind of the the backwards Mm -hmm. concern here, which is really quite interesting. And that happened because when I introduced it to professional learning groups, right, um, I, I did emphasize relationship with self, understanding frameworks of who we are and what we do, and um and developing relational school cultures okay so when you ask me uh, and and it's that has worked right but it's not like i mean we have we we are a small province in terms of people right Five hundred thousand mm-hmm. people um i don't know exactly how many schools 200 and some odd schools and you know there's only about 40 or 50 schools that are engaging with restorative justice in some form or another because it hasn't been mandated right yeah it's been invitational right and so in seven or eight years you know a fifth of the schools have been engaging with restorative justice in education in some way shape or form and many of the other educators know about it okay and and so my vision is about coming at it from the ground up so that it is invitational so that the change can happen from within and in time that as the educators become comfortable with it that they will begin to ask and share with the people who are leading them what restorative justice is and that's um david starting to happen here yeah Right. And so we have reports, for instance, of the director of of our district, though he's not been trained in circles, he's sat (laughs) in circles that educators have have um, have facilitated. And when he goes across the province to meet with administrators, he's now doing those in circle. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what's my vision? Um, Yeah, you know, if I hear what you're talking about in terms of the Sudbury school schools, and I'm not real clear on, on, I don't know about that. In my dream of dreams, it sounds exactly like I want it to be right. Um, And I think that restorative justice can really um, inform that in terms when when it's understood holistically, but then I'll go Mm -hmm. back to what you talked about you know, but isn't that then transformative justice? Yeah. And you know what? I, I have to admit that from the beginning, I was much more interested in the concepts of transformative justice. But over the years, the terminology that began to stick 
was restorative justice, right? So I had to, so I felt like I had to make a decision that would have the biggest impact. And I was seeing that restorative justice in many ways was being misunderstood in school context, but it was being called restorative. Mm. Okay. So then I thought, well, I, I can encourage a different terminology so that we talk about transformative justice. But I actually felt like the field had progressed already to that point that, and maybe it was the wrong decision on my part, right? But instead, what I did then was I looked really carefully at how to understand restorative justice in a transformative way. So I would say restorative justice understood holistically is a transformative, is a transformative experience because restorative justice is not just about the relationship of people with each other, but people with their environments and people within the organizations. And so if their relationships are addressed and understood more deeply, then I think the structures, the systems can change. So I think trans, so I would say that I'm working out of, you know, a transformative understanding of restorative justice. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think like I, I had this conversation with some of the people like, Indigenous people yeah. wouldn't use any of these words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And I was going to, and one of the things that I wanted to say was that, you know, you don't need the words, mm -hmm. right, to live it. Absolutely. And I think, and I believe very, very firmly that the number one responsibility of restorative justice or transformative justice is to find a way to create a space for indigenous peoples to lead. I believe that that's, you know, they have been so suppressed and so oppressed. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so thrilled that we're hearing and listening, at least in part, more fully. But we are because they continue to model and live out of a relational framework. So in Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission headed up by Senator um, Murray Sinclair, right, um, was an incredible model of that for us, right? We never talked about it being restorative justice. However, you know, um, Nelson Mandela and uh, Desmond Tutu in South Africa, for instance, they did talk about truth and reconciliation through a restorative justice approach right mm -hmm. so you know the principles are the same the language changes and shifts and that's what i'm grappling with and what i said at the beginning as well is how do i stop talking you know like really you shouldn't be talking to me mm -hmm. really you know and i and i'm and you know what just even as i'm thinking that i'm going like I, you know i should have put you on to an indigenous person in Mialpakuk First Nation mm -hmm. where their school is living this out of their framework, right? And that's the thing then that I use my privilege for and I, I chose to speak instead of them. I, I mean, I would still take that connection. <laughs> yeah. And I will, <laughs> and I'll. You, you can expand on that. I'd love to hear you expand on like how you view your role as a white person uh, a white person who's a settler, right, uh, doing this work? I'm really struggling with that mm -hmm. because I'm currently working through me and white supremacy, which is really helpful. Layla Saad? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Which I'm finding very helpful. But one of the things that I've learned through that is that I tend to go silent rather than advocate because I'm not sure exactly how to advocate. Because if I advocate, how do I make sure that it's not my voice that becomes prominent, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I'm really grappling with that, okay? Um, And, and so my number one responsibility, I believe, 
is to have conversations with my peers who are white, right? That's, that's where my work is. And I'm tentatively engaging in the work with Black, Indigenous, and people of color in a way that I'm working hard to listen deeply and not to speak. One of the things that Kathy and I have been very grateful for, and this is where we believe, and I heard Kay Prentice talk about this, about you know the truth that's within us, right? Mm -hmm. um, is, is that people like Sky Bowen in, in Toronto area, Sky and Cheryl Wilson and, you know, others. And also in my communication with Chief Missile Joe and uh, Indigenous peoples in this province, the perspective that Kathy and I put forward seems to resonate and reflect their perspectives. I'm thankful for that, but I am humbled by that when somebody like Sky will use our work. But I think my, my number one responsibility is, um, is with my colleagues and friends and family who are white. And not to say this is what has to change, but to say, let's open up the space to share our ideas and take risks in what we say and to hold ourselves to expectations of what it means to be human in that fullest sense of the word. So, um, and I'm very much indebted to the work of Paulo Freire and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and his, his work around rehumanizing, right? Conscientization. His work has very much influenced me. Yeah. And, I, and I was able to go to Brazil a couple years ago because my work was grounded in Paulo Freire's work. And in Brazil, they hadn't been thinking about the connection between restorative justice and Paulo Freire, right? So I was very, yeah. very conscious of the fact that I was bringing something back to them that was already part of their culture, so to speak, or their the ways of thinking around education through the work of Paulo Freire. And I know that that has, you know, you know, isn't welcomed by everybody there either. Right? Yeah. So I don't know. I'm long winded. Sorry. <laughs> no, um, I, I appreciate the vulnerability. Um, if I could ask a follow up to that, you know, you talked about, you know, your role in having these conversations with your white colleagues, friends, peers, like, mm -hmm. what does that look like for you? It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. It's very challenging. Because there is a, a vulnerability, like there's a, a fragility, not vulnerability, mm -hmm. fragility. So I think about it as we think about different things in education, about scaffolding, right? Mm -hmm. And the need to bring people into a familiarity with circle dialogue in gentle ways before we tap into more challenging ways, okay? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Um, it's very difficult and I don't think we're very far, okay? <laughs> but, but it is something that I, I suggest and I recommend, I plant seeds for, you know, it would be really good to do this. Probably have to become more assertive in terms of actually organizing circles to discuss mm -hmm. those harder topics. Yeah. And I do it, I do it with my adult um, students when I teach. Mm -hmm. I'm also an associate professor at, at Memorial University, but I'm, academics is a foreign world to me because none of my family went to higher education and so on and so forth. Sure. Most of my family didn't. 
and and I'm a primary I think primarily a primary elementary educator so sure sure but I mean it's it's done me well in a lot of ways and so in all my classes or all the committees that I chair I do in circle so if mm-hmm. somebody says to, if one of my you know if my dean says Dorothy will you chair this committee I'll say yeah I'll I'll do it but you need to know I'm going to do it in circle and that doesn't always go real smoothly but I've learned sure. I've learned how to scaffold people into those spaces mm-hmm. right whereas I think initially years ago I jumped in too quickly often right so people were like what are you doing you know I don't want to have anything to do with this and and now I kind of scaffold um, and so it's a journey, David. It's a it's a journey, and there's really great things that happen, but it's not a panacea. But I believe it's the best thing we've got right now mm-hmm. in terms of a vision for what could be. But we're going to have to grow. We're going to have to change our minds. We're going to have to grow. We're going to have to recognize where we got it wrong. And I do believe that, you know what, it's okay to get it wrong. But that's that westernized colonizing way of being is we think that we got to have, there's a perfect way. There's no, there's no perfect way. Mm -hmm. You know, there just isn't. And so we have to learn how to, you know, like I, I have at the bottom of my email, Rumi, the Persian poet, philosopher Rumi from the 13th century who said mm-hmm. out beyond right doing and wrong doing there is a field and I will meet you there yeah and I've tried to take that off of my um, signature line in my email many times and I can't because it's it's critical for me in my life because I was raised in a right doing and wrong doing context and so it's still my default right and so every time I send an email, I have to ask myself that question. You know what? Is this about right doing or wrong doing? Or is this about me welcoming a conversation, a difficult conversation? I'm going to invite you to take a breath with me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for all of that sharing. It really, it really takes a lot, and so many of us have so much to do. Um, we all, we all have different roles to play in this work, um, and, and so I appreciate you for uh, being here, wrestling with that publicly, um, and and sharing with you know also a lot of the people who are white who are listening to this. It's an invitation for you as well. Um, you've said it in many different ways, um, but I'm curious. How do you define restorative justice? Oh, yeah. Okay, the really short version. Sure. Um, it's about moving people and schools and institutions and cultures from being rule based to relationship based. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I like that. You get to sit in circle with four people, living or dead. Who are they, and what question do you ask oh. in the circle? Oh, yeah. What question? Um, my father. Mm-hmm. Because he was a very quiet man, and he was in hiding for two years during the war. Um and he never talked about that. Um, I think Archbishop Desmond Tutu, because of his perspective and and the hope he had that in the end evil would not win. And I, and this is not a, um, a single person, but uh, survivors of. Um, residential schools 
you know, I'm just realizing that all of the people that I'm saying, other than that group, that survivors, um, um, the next person that I'm thinking of is Chief or, or Senator Murray Sinclair, who headed up the TRC here in Canada. You know, they're all men. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what that's telling me. But um, what question? Probably something like, where is your pain? Sometimes I turn that question back to the guests. Mm. Are you willing to answer that right now? Oh, I'll try. My pain is in knowing that I have the capacity to cause harm. Yeah. And my pain is also in having, in being a watcher and seeing the pain that in young children, in adults, in colleagues, in my spaces of privilege, but in particular, those spaces that um, I don't have access to like the survivors of residential schools or murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's where my pain is because it's, um, I wanted to be much more normal to be able to talk about our pain without needing to hide our pain. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I don't think it's fair for me to not answer yes, the question please. now. I should have, um, I should have asked you. I yeah. should have said, and yeah, what yeah, about yeah. you, David? Yeah. Where is your pain? Um, right now, it's that I'm not giving myself space for rest. Mm. I'm like, I'm ha I, my expectations of myself are beyond my capacity. Yeah. Um, and I'm, even as we speak, just pushing down that pain and pushing through. <laughs> I hear you. That's true for me too. And so I, I remember, you know, six weeks ago committing to this interview and then waking up this morning and going like, oh my goodness, what did I say yes to? Um, because, you know, I have five projects on my plate, right? Um, mm. But I appreciate, yeah, I've been, it's been good to have this conversation, David. Right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, as much as like, this is a product that we're sharing with the world, it's also like an experience yeah. that we're having here. And so I'm like really grateful for that as well. Yeah. Um, What's one mantra or affirmation you want everyone listening right now to know? Is what you say what you do? Mm. Not all the time. Mm. And my other one would be the Rumi quote. Yeah. Out beyond right doing and wrong doing, there is a field, and I will meet you there. Um, two more questions. Oh, okay. Uh, who's one person that I should have on this podcast? And you've got to help me get them on. <laughs> we talked earlier about, um, you know, an, uh, an educator in an Indigenous school context. And to be honest, um, I, I don't have strong connections that way, but I'm going to give that a lot more thought. Okay. So one person, uh, another person, oh, um, Michelle Stowe, Sky Bowen. Have you had Sky Bowen on? Uh, I'm talking to Sky. Yeah, I was going to say right about Sky. Definitely about. Sky yeah. Bowen, right? Um, Michelle Stowe in Ireland is another 
good person. All right. I don't know. Do you know Michelle or her work? I don't at oh, all. Okay. So I will be looking forward to that introductory email. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's done a TEDx, TED talk or TEDx talk. That's really fun. Gotcha. And then finally, uh, how can people support you and your work in the ways that you want to be supported? Oh, well, I think just know about it. Right. I mean, um, so the little book of restorative justice education, it came out in 2016. So it's been around for a while. Um, there you go. And um, it's not the end all and be all. And I would love for people to engage with it and, and um, reflect on it critically. Yeah, I think that would be good because I, I, I'm incredibly passionate about uh, understanding um, beliefs and values and the importance of that. So that's how can people support my work by challenging themselves to learn the work and to stop thinking about how this is good for others. Um, and then on a practical note, we do have a website called Relationships First Restorative Justice. In it. No, it, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, relation, RelationshipsFirstNL.com. Um, and that'll be linked in the show notes. Yes, yeah, um, it, it'll be under revision. Some, it's got some problems and so on, but at least it's, you know, our implementation guide is there and we are hoping to revise it in the next year to to actually have um, you know to have it as a partnership or collaboration with indigenous educators in Newfoundland and Labrador, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm you know I'm comfortable with most of it in there, but yeah, so um, that's fine. It's it's out there. Just you know, if you use it, give credit to it. And, um, but the purpose is, and I said this in the. Um, uh, radical love or recolonization. It's not to be afraid of uh, challenging each other to recognize uh, how restorative justice might be causing harm. And let, let's not yeah. let's not um, turn it into um, uh, a movement, an evangelical movement. I guess. <laughs> For sure. Uh, well, thank you so much as we both shared. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, I appreciate your time and the wisdom and experiences that you've shared. Are there any other things that you want to leave the listeners with? Um, no, just thank you for listening um, and for learning uh, and be, and thank you. Yeah. Just thank you for listening, learning and being open to, to changing. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Dorothy. Uh, everyone else will be back next week. Until then, take care. Thank you, Dorothy. I really appreciated when Dorothy mentioned that the number one priority and responsibility of transformative and restorative justice is to give Indigenous people a space to lead. So many spaces have been taken from Indigenous leaders, and it's really important to keep restorative justice as a space that honors Indigenous roots and Indigenous values. I thought this was a really important way to start off the episode and to really tie in all of these values. I think another really important point that Dorothy brought up was intentions, especially when it comes to administration who wants to implement restorative or transformative justice. Oftentimes when these systems are implemented within schools, it comes from a top-down approach where the administrators want more control in this extra area of justice. If the intention in the implementation of restorative and transformative justice is surrounding control, then it does not follow these indigenous values and it's not going to be as effective. What is your personal definition of justice and how do you practice intentionality within restorative justice? Again, thank you so much for listening to this episode today and don't forget to check out our Future Ancestors Collective, all of our workshops and courses, and our YouTube channel. And all the information you need will be linked in the show notes below. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you next week. Like what you heard? Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this podcast on whatever platform you're using right now. 
It really helps us further amplify this work. You can also support us by following us on our social platforms, signing up for our email list, rocking our new merch, joining our Patreon, or signing up for a workshop. So many options! Links to everything in the show notes and on our website, AmplifyRJ.com. Thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.